if you want to start, why don't you just introduce yourself and then I'll start in on the questions. So just who you are and a little bit about yourself. Okay. I'm Hua Lu, a research scientist in British Antarctic Survey. My research is mainly about atmospheric circulation and especially the layer called the stratosphere where the ozone is most uh, strong and how that layer can be coupled into the near surface and affect the weather um, seasonal or sub-seasonal time scales. Hmm. That's good. And, and so can you tell us about what studies you did that you've ended up working on that? Right. Um, the, the main uh, thing, what, when I joined uh, the British Antarctic Survey, I was supposed to do something about atmosphere uh, interaction, and which is a layer we very uh, bit remote from my training background. So I decided to move a little bit downward into the stratosphere where the data are more, and also there's the air is more tight with my uh, training background, which is mathematics. Can you tell us about you? What degrees have you got, and where did you study? Right, I got my uh, uh, mathematical training in China, so it's pure math. Okay, it's all about equations, all, all about the theory and the numbers, and all those kind of. Uh, logical abstract training. Then I moved to Australia for personal reasons. Then I got an opportunity to do some applied research, but still math uh, uh, orientated. It's about when modeling wind erosion. Um, so that is a first step I get into environmental science. And since then, I never go back to mathematics. So I enjoy applying my math to real world problems. That's my drive and, and my passion. That is excellent. And what's fun about your research and being a mathematician? I think the fun is relevancy. So if you think what you are doing can benefit the world, benefit other people, and help people understand certain pro uh, processes so people can resolve the, the issues. So that's the, the, the most fun part for me. So that's my, my, I want to kind of contribute using the skills I have, which is mathematics, statistics, and the ability to deal with data, and then use my logic training through the math degree to summarize in a quantitative way of what is going on in that complex system and how one thing in one region can be linked to other things in other regions. And uh, this relationship can be achieved by statistics like correlations and also by complex equations, which can be nonlinear, to say that a change in this domain can be uh, linear in one way, but in once the circumstance changes, they, their relationship will change in the opposite way. But this, it would be very complex using uh, statistics in that situation. So using Nonlinear non equation can achieve that, to help people to think why these two are linked and how can we use the information from one area to resolve uh, the unknowing domain, which we want to understand. That's very cool. And currently, are you working on something about how to predict the weather out, you know, four weeks ahead instead of just two weeks ahead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's at the moment our weather uh, can be uh, the the, the uh, weather centers can make really accurate prediction up to seven days. 
beyond seven days, the models won't be able to predict accurately. The reason being is that weather system in a regional area is governed by synoptic um, weather chart. And that weather charts, the synoptic patterns will disappear and replaced by another. But this replacement is normally governed by very slow motions in the atmosphere in the other regions. We call it teleconnections. Okay, the teleconnections can be like uh, in the Atlantic region be linked to something happening in Pacific Ocean. And in my understanding, uh, my area is vertical. If something happened in a layer where the ozone is very strong, uh, which is due, induced by the sun, and another would be that, that also that air, uh, layer has a, a gent gentatic, very strong jet, we call it polar vortex in the winter. That polar vortex wobbles, okay? And that wobbling, the more they wobble, the more that this uh, vortex wobbles, the more likely we will have uh, either cold weather or hot weather because of variability. And the connection between that layer and the near surface weather in the UK, like snowy weather, would be about more than a week. We call it a sub season. And also sometimes in the early winter that layer has very strong uh, impact in midwinter and that's a seasonal time scale. So I'm looking at this two time scale and to say how we can improve our weather prediction beyond seven days. Oh, and that sounds very interesting and something that everyone wants to be able to hear and understand, I think. So you've traveled all around the world to end up here in the UK. Um, what can you tell us the best thing is about working at the British Antarctic Survey? I think that people, I love the people in British Antarctic Survey because I think that diversity in the building, not only in the background, but mainly in the research expertise. So people are do, carry on research on ice, on uh, the weather near the Antarctic coastline and also inland of um, uh, Antarctica. And also people are looking at the ocean. So, and also like other people are looking at space weather. So we have vast, vast amount of knowledge within the building. So it's very easy to engage collaboration with people from different backgrounds. And also people are very keen to collaborate. That's the most fun part, I think, being working with British Antarctic Survey. Oh, that's very good. And what do you think the big challenges are for attracting students into maths and into environmental science at the moment? Um, that's a, a very big and also very good question. I think the math is a hard training. It's a hard subject. So then people need to say, I enter a very hard subject and where my career will be. So the, the, most of people traditionally, once you become a, a mathematician, you basically either doing teaching in the high school or become a professor in a university math department. But uh, from my own experience is if you are problem orientated, real world problem orientated, then one skill you can train um, yourself or by select the right uh, subject when you are doing your uh, degree in order to say how I transfer the equations to 
model the real world problem. So that is one thing I think the university need to really move to. Rather than traditional way of mostly and the hard logical part of training and it become more and more because they wanted to push the boundary in terms of rigorous importance in terms of how the complex equations can be solved analytically. But nowadays with the computer, you don't need to really do the analytical uh, training by solving a partial different equation uh, using um, hand cranking um, equations, you know, but you can solve it just to put into code into the, the, the computer, then solve all the scales together, right? But then once you get that point, what the next for training is to, okay, how we match those equations with real world problems. So that is something I think would be nice to, to be move on in the, in the university. Another is um, how in the university, how to make this uh, interdisciplinary training and work. So how the math department can open some subject by having lectures from environment department, geology department, earth science department, you know. So mix this uh, applied but still natural sciences, right, with mathematicians. So that's something I'm, I'm thinking, but uh, to put into practice is a hard thing, but need to think in that direction. That's my, uh, my thinking. Oh, they're good ideas. And I don't think, I, we don't have any trouble. We mix geology and mathematics all right when we talk, don't we? No, no, it's, it's about the training, how you design the courses. So in that way is uh, you design the courses to suit certain uh, applied orientated student. And uh, so then you design some courses to suit people are highly up, uh, objective, highly, um, uh, how to say it, thinking into the th developed theories, right? So in that, that sense is people who are more applied can choose certain pathway and the more theoretical um, orientated people can choose different pathway. That's my, my thinking. No, that'd be a good idea. Sometimes when I walk into your office, I see you coding on one screen and on another screen, you've got models and on another screen, you've got graphs. What does a normal day look like for you to be an applied mathematician? Okay. Uh, the a normal day would be looking at uh, the data and then try to look, uh, make links either you first the thing is exploring exploring the relationship in the data so the maps are the uh, and uh, analyze data are the first step then if there is certain relationship then we go back to the fluid dynamics and say what equations actually may play a role in their relationship. So there's an iteration, you know, uh, of uh, exploring the relationship, then try to summarize the relationship in a more simpler way, then go back to the basics and say if we can summarize into an equation. And then they use the equation to map back to the data and say whether or not that equation explain or match the data. So that's what normally I do. Yeah, I don't think you have many days that are the same though, are you? You've got lots of different days? Yeah, sometimes you will be very fun to find, oh, this works. But next day you think, no, 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 not really work. There's something behind if you move to another uh, 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 days or not another period, the relationship breaks down. So then you need to say, okay, I need to add something to this equation to condition. Okay, what is condition? This would work. 
So basically, that is a science uh, steps. Is you not always get the first time all right. Sometimes involve ten times and different things. Another thing is communication. That means publication. Once you get your results, you need to organize the your result in a logical way, and also allow people to understand. So you need to state clearly what is the motivation and what problem you want to re resolve or the results you have, then you will make some discussions, link your results to previous re uh, studies, then you will summarize, okay? And this is take long training. Sometimes it, you, you get results, it take half a year to write the results properly. Uh, especially when the problem is complex, because how no matter how complex it is, it is scale to make it simple to understand. I can understand that it would be. And what do you think the value is of having people from different backgrounds and the different areas of research to collaborate with you? Oh, that's always a fun part and important part. Nowadays, most of the environment problems are integrated. One area is infused into another area. And some of the area has already developed the tools to solve similar problem, but in a different context. So you don't want to reinvent the wheel, but if you don't work with other people, then you tend up to reinvent the wheel and spend lots of time just to try to understand people, a problem people already had good tools to deal with. So that when, when you work with other people, why is you can borrow other people's knowledge and ideas to solve the problem you have. Another importantly is not, nowadays, we cannot solve a problem by yourself, mostly. Mostly you have to use existing tools like climate model, which has loads of different component and the modules, and you have no chance to understand all the modules. So by having people who develop the modules or have knowledge about these modules with you, so you are more balanced in a way when you write things, when you get the results, you know the results is trustable or there's bias in the model, assumption in the model, and you only can trust the results at that level. So the uncertainty and the bias in the tools you use can come from collaboration. That's excellent. And you work with people from all around the world? Yeah, because I worked a different area. Um, so when I did my PhD, I worked on wind erosion, which look at uh, uh, scales from very, very uh, small scale near the surface, how a particle jump lifted by the winds near surface and jump and then go come back to the surface and create uh, uh, the bombardment to the surface, right? And then how we use the equation, that's my contributions, use the equation to describe that problem. But that is too small scale. And the real world problem is how a wind erosion dust lifted can be transported from large area like Sahara to Europe, for instance. That's a huge, much, much larger scale. So. The, the thing I, I did is to work with uh, climate modelers, put my little module, which is small scale, and uh, into a large scale model as a module, sub module, then say how the dust generated by small scale um, interaction near the, the, the particles, surface and wind transport to from one region to another. So that is one problem I really enjoyed doing. Then when my first job came in, I was doing soil erosion. 
And so you say it's similar, but with different uh, fluids. So from air to water. But the, the real problem is to say uh, in Australia, which is a semi-arid country, then you have uh, the severe water erosion going on and uh, because of the rain only come from very short period of time, intense. Then there's no rain, the soil become very dry, very little vegetation to protect the soil. So traditionally, people look at that process only at a very fine scale. They don't look at the catchment scale because it's too complex. But uh, the time I worked with the CSRO, and the, we start to have some large scale information like digital elevation models, large scale land use patterns, and remote sensing of vegetation. So with this information, the challenge is how we can com combine those information to predict uh, the soil erosion and sediment transport. So we can better protect the waterways, which is a vital in Australia economy. So that uh, is what I did is from that experience, I learned one vital thing. It's not always complex tools are better than simple ones. Instead, simple ones is better than complex in that sense, because when you deal with massive amount of data and uh, doing very detailed calculation will take ages. And also the nonlinearity within the system will blow the model very easily. So sometimes uh, the simple combination of uh, those uh, fine detailed spatial information can give you relative sense of which areas more at risk of uh, erosion and sediment transport and other areas less. So we are not achieving something precise in terms of amount of sediment were delivered from one region to another. We are comparing region A with region B and say how more, how risk it is for the region A. And we already know like uh, Murray Darling Basin is very important for Australian economy. So then we look into that basin and look at the relative uh, in, um, rate of erosion would it be. So the decision makers can make a decision so which area we can put more resource to protect economy and land and the environment together. That's very good to be able to use your maths and you know in combination with those real world problems and to you know help in the future. I mean that sounds like an amazing day's work doesn't it? Yeah and all working with people who know soil so well different time and then working with people about uh, the how the vegetation um, a the, the type of vegetation land use there. And so it's really, really good experience by contributing as well as learning. No, that's fantastic. So you're working with the British Antarctic Survey. Have you ever been to the Antarctic or to the North Pole yet? No, no. Um, that's the a pity part um, because I'm a mathematician, right? So going to this area normally you need an experiment in hand, in mind at least, or a project associated with. I would love to go with a purpose, right? Uh, at the moment, I have plenty to do, and I work with people who design those uh, experiments, and they have data collected. Then I help them to analyze the data. Still, I think in somehow, some way, I, I work with those people who have both hand of uh, uh, information about the site and about uh, Antarctica and the North Pole. And how do you think we could uh, attract people from more diverse backgrounds into polar research? I think the 
we, this is a hard question because I think a lot of uh, youngsters want to get into the environmental research. And then it's constrained by how many posts we have and also constrained by the training provided in the society. So one thing important is to well define what, we, what type of training we need in the next five or 10 years. Right, and then make this more public uh, available so people from different, uh, have a different mindset or culture or training to know what the future direction will be in the environment science or in the polo science, what type of skills they need. And then the people have that uh, mindset won't get in, will find the footing in. That's my, my, it's too, too, too broad, I think. <laughs> but, I mean, you've enjoyed, you, I mean, you never, did you ever think you would work in polar research? And how do you think we would have done a better job at um, showing you what was available at polar research? The website is playing a vital role so if the website will define what the activity is going on in Antarctica and in uh, Arctic and what type of research we are doing, right? And how the teams are tackle certain problems, that's one. Another is the media. I think that Bridging and our survey media team is doing a fantastic job in terms of what is going on uh, with the ships and with the, our uh, stations, okay? The activity is always in the news. And it's not actually happening regularly in the universities. In that perspective, I think British Antarctic Survey is doing a fantastic job in terms of advertising the research activity we are doing. And you're involved in the Polar Horizons project last year. Do you think that sort of outreach to students from minority groups is going to help us attract more people of a different diversity into polar science? Definitely. That's definite. Because that, it hasn't been happening before, you know. People are too busy with their own subjects and uh, they Traditionally, they only select the people who are the best, you know, competitive and ignore the diversity, ignore the possibility of the minority people may need a chance to get into the area. So having a Polar Horizon 2020 is a fantastic idea. And so allow those people to say what is going on in the polar research and how polar scientists are doing their job in a harsh environment and things like that is a fantastic new idea. So Hua, can you tell us what's one of the fun projects you've worked on at the British Antarctic Survey? Oh uh, yeah, recently I worked with a team on uh, inhomogeneous of a temperature record at Halley. Because Halley is a station, British Antarctic Survey start to record the temperature and other meteorological parameter since 1958. And, uh, but recently we found that the moving station from one side to another seems created some in jumps in the record. Um, this is important to inform the, the public how these jumps can affect the temperature trend in the Antarctic, giving Halley is a station which is very valuable, not many other stations nearby. 
So this is a very fun part because we have a, have a team who with uh, people has vast amount of knowledge about highly near surface processes. And also the people manage the data on a daily basis to remove species record. And me, a mathematician, can kind of uh, forget about all the, 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 the environment there because I don't have any knowledge, but I have a knowledge to look at objectively whether or not there is a statistically significant jump. So this is a team effort which end up with uh, communicating with people how complex even measuring a, a, a temperature on a six hourly or even hourly basis can have a bias and a variability. And uh, so how the environment like the ocean, the movement of the sea ice shelf can have an impact on that. So from that processes, as again, I think I contributed using my math background and also learned a lot from my colleagues who have been in Antarctic, uh, working there in a harsh environment that know what is going on from the area. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just fantastic thinking. Just in my head, it's a massively flat, um, cold ice can have a steep temperature gradient across that region. How moving a station from just uh, 10 kilometers can change the temperature record. And then we can offer people the ideas how you make a, a adjustment. And when you use the data, why you need to be very careful about the jumps. That is very good and very interesting, isn't it? Because we put a lot of effort and resources into going down there and getting the data. Do you think COVID has actually made people look at all this old data a little bit differently and encourage people to use data that's already collected? Um, yeah, well, the data always been used and also uh, collected. In the olden days, people have to go out to collect the data every hour, every three hours. And, uh, but now it's uh, quite a lot of data collected automatically. By collecting automatically means sometimes there are things happening, people don't notice can uh, uh, make an error, you know? But if you do not really go into the data properly and analyze and find the bias and the error, then they can be just creeping into the climate model mm -hmm. and people don't like, take a notice. So as a scientist, we need to be rigorous. So we checked this time and we find there are artificial jumps due to station move and then we gave the reason for it. Mm -hmm. And then we quantify the jumps and then we make suggestions how the data should be used. Oh, that is very cool. And how you talked about um, communicating your findings and how many papers you've written, but how many papers do you think you have written? About uh, 60 to 70. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. All right. Thank you, Fua. Thank you.